Hi everyone, welcome back. Today I'm going to give you a little bit of a breakdown for the scene we're looking at here. We've got a complex display case with some vegetation elements, some volumetrics, and the character from Daniel Beistert's EV demo, which is available on the Blender demo website. And these vegetation assets are from BD3D on Superhive, the creator of the scatter add-on. The reason why I've done this render is because I'm currently doing some tests for an update for my Afterglow asset library for Blender. Afterglow is my set of complex, physically-based lighting tools. What I mean by that is, instead of having lamp objects in cycles all of the lights provided by shader elements so actually physically present lights in the scene there's a lot you can do with it but i wanted to do a display case update for a while so having different shapes and sizes of display cases which provide some nice physical context for the scene and i got a little bit carried away last night working on this because there were just so many cool angles and cool effects that i like wanted to carry on trying and like so many different lighting combinations you can play with get some really cool results and i just got a bit excited with it so in the end i thought ah I've got to tell people a little bit about this. You know, like, how does he do the hexagonal roughness tiling on the glass? And how did you get text inside of the glass as well? And stuff like that. Okay, don't worry, we're going to talk about it. Before we do, consider subscribing. If you're on mobile, I think you might be able to hype the video as well. I don't know how that works. It's a new feature, but apparently it helps. And a lot of my work is enabled by my patrons. Now, I will put a variation of this file on my Patreon for the $5 tier and above. So that's the silver tier. It won't include everything because, of course, not every asset here is mine but one thing i tend to do is as i'm working on experiments i'll make some of those available on our members lounge which is basically a nice library where the silver tier patrons can browse the content available to them so let's kind of break this down logically so like I said, I was working on display cases of different sizes. Right now, this is the largest one I've created. One of the reasons why I was kind of preparing different sizes was because display cases for a lighting tool or lighting asset library could be many different sizes for many different types of focus objects or props or characters, cars, nature assets, whatever that someone might want to display in a very pretty way. If I establish kind of default dimensions on different categories, then I could do different styles of displays and keeping them to a unified kind of scale would make that useful. I also wanted to see the interactions of lights. Inside of the display cases, I've got like ceiling lights and floor lights, which aren't necessarily active at the moment, but I can turn them on. Let me go to the right kind of material. Let's plug that in. The right now, as we can see on this color ramp, imagine it going from black to white, although I need to fix the mapping a bit, but the white is more right biased as it is here. But if I change that, make it like blue, for example, at the moment that's represented more in the center, until I fix the mapping, then it's providing blue light in. I can also up the light of that, you know, make it much stronger, and you'll see what happens there. But we don't need that at the moment. But working within confined spaces like this got me thinking about light domains in the same way that you might have volume domains. Think about it in the way of we've got new volume features coming to geometry nodes. And with a lot of volume simulation tools, or like smoke sims, fluid sims, etc., they tend to work within a cubic domain because if you define a resolution for that grid, it's easy to do calculations on the neighboring cells rather than something that's not kept to a grid and is instead just arbitrary. This is not exactly the same, but it got me thinking working within a confined box for lighting, which is something that we don't usually think about, gives you like almost a grid-like space where you can create lots of different lighting variations just by restricting the movement of the lights within that grid. So basically, display cases while doing this experimentation for me became this interesting idea of a lighting domain, which is similar to like the light cages I've done in Afterglow so far. And it's just the idea that restricting lighting within a physical space gives you like a set of rules, which can assist with the lighting and look I mean the results are freaking great so it's just an interesting thing to think about. This uh, seven text here in the glass, this is actually a separate object. So it's not a shader or it's not an element of the shader or for the actual glass cage here. It's a separate object, but it's kind of kept within the glass. So let me just show you that. So I go into wireframe. See, we've got the object here. Now the glass itself does have a tiny amount of thickness to it, as you can see, but we've got this face here and the actual seven is within that thickness. So we've got the glass. I don't know how easy that'll be to see. Let me zoom in. We've got one side and the other side and right here in the middle is that number seven. So it's within the glass structure. And really the thing that gives it this lovely, slightly blur faded effect is that A, the glass is using a glass BSDF, right? So that's the actual display glass. But this inside text, if I grab the right one, is also using a glass BSDF, but they have slightly different roughness values. So the case itself, 
has a more complex roughness pattern, which is actually this whole hexagonal thing going on. But we can talk a bit more about that soon. It's a bit hard to see here at the moment, but you can see some hexagons down there. And that's a gradient where it's a stronger hexagon pattern going down to nothing. And this number seven is just a roughness of 0 0.179. And this also kind of acts as the opacity in a way, because that roughness of zero, you will still see it there, but it's just kind of blended straight into the glass. And at a really high roughness, it's bright again. And that is modified by the color you set. I like to keep it on white. And again, 0.179 is a good value for that at the moment. I apologize if the screen looks blurry. Obviously, there's a lot happening at the moment, and we've got denoising active because otherwise it will look well. Can you imagine what it will look like? Let's see. Not great for previewing for a video, is it? <laughs> I bet YouTube compression would hate that. So a point about that is, yes, this is very render intense because there's a lot happening at once. Every angle I find when moving around this, I'm just so happy with. A little tip for the cameras, by the way, I tend to use a lot of cameras to experiment with different angles and having a naming convention for them has kind of been a little bit annoying in the past. What I've done is I've just given them all the same kind of name where one camera has one star or one asterisk, then the next one has two, which is in this case, a vertical resolution. That's very cool as well. I love that one. Next one's got three, four, etc. And if you're wondering how it's swapping resolution between each camera, I'm using the per camera resolution add-on, which is from the extensions platform. So if you go to get extensions and edit preferences, there's per camera resolution you can find. You'll need to search for it and then install it. So it's freely available. Now for this hexagonal glass thing going on, I'm actually using a node group from one of my products. So the actual product is the procedural patterns product. And I'm sorry if you know this seems like an advertisement too much. The thing is my work is for paid products. So I'm building products, tools, assets, whatever. So it's only natural that the things I'm going to use and mention are the things I previously made. The procedural patterns product is a collection of node groups which provide patterns to use in the shader editor and a few demonstration materials. The one I'm using here is called hexagon tiles. So naturally it creates a tiling pattern of hexagons. I wonder if I created a prince board quickly, plug that into the color. Yeah, it's a bit dark, but you can just about see that. The way I got it to wrap around the object was to do a quick UV map of the object. And I did the cube projection. So, you know, that will basically do the projection from each angle of the UV map. This hexagon pattern was modified by a gradient. So I did a generated texture coordinate down to a separate XYZ, took the Z value, made a gradient from the color ramp, passed it as a factor, then mixed black. So nothing with the hexagonal pattern based on the gradient, which is the factor. The multiplier is basically the intensity of the roughness, and then that provides the effect. So if I increased the multiplication, you'll see that the roughness also increases. And then I can use like this as the gradient here. I could also do math nodes here to modify the position of the gradient in space, but it's not really required at the moment. But let me reset those values. So I'm using this old hexagonal tile node, but you could use any noise texture you want. Let me just show you it here in case you want to just see the nodes for that. Again, there's space for improvement. Like here, I could do some modification for the gradient to make it a more appropriate layout. You know, there's there's lots of room for improvement there, but that's how it works. This loose one up here was just because the display case used to just be the glass shader with a bit of roughness before I did the hexagonal patterning. So this is what it used to look like. Nice, clean, plain, nothing wrong with that. But with the hexagonal, we get like a really cool disturbance effect. And you know, you could replace that with textures as well, because like I said, I've got a UV mapped based on a cubic projection. If you had a surface imperfection map, you could do that. Now, when it comes to actually making content for my Afterglow update, for the display cases. Maybe I will put some surface imperfection in it. Maybe I won't. We'll see how it goes. But this is basically why I'm doing render tests like this so I can see what works visually and what doesn't. This emissive line in here is just a cylinder. Principal BSDF emission color red, but not completely red with a high value. And I have some glare active in the compositor. You can see here. That's just stylistic. You know, it just looks cool. There's no other way to explain that. You can rotate it around based on the pivot being at the base of one end of the cylinder, being physically light if we put it the right way you can get a bit of light bouncing off the character as you can see here it's quite reactive to the light so it's just a fun little thing to play with one thing i do want to play with more is the idea of having specific patterns for the ceiling in the same vein that i've done for other elements of the afterglow asset library where the environments themselves have different ceiling light patterns that's something you'll be familiar with if you've seen my previous work but it's something i can also represent here because this floor comes from studio environment 6 from afterglow and this itself is lightable and image patterns can be applied to it if needed for example Oh, I don't have the images included in this file. That's why it's pink, because this is a stripped down version. But in theory, I could 
grab some. Let's drag you in. There we go. Now I've got triangles on the floor. Again, this is from the Afterglow Asset Library. This would come under one by two light patterns and I've gone for triangles small. In this case, I know the nodes are messy. I connected it to the flip direction vector and plugged that into the emissive color. This is relatively advanced stuff when it comes to physical lighting, but now we'll get the influence of that on the scene as well. May not be visible from these camera angles, but it may be shown from other angles and in certain reflections and stuff like that. But the principle applies in the same way that I've got this image mapping for the spatial environment lighting. I was thinking maybe it would be nice to do some image mapping for the display lighting as well. So I don't know exactly how or when I'll get to doing that. Maybe soon, maybe not. There's actually quite a lot to deconstruct from this and play with, but I will say regardless, it's been quite fun and I'm really happy with kind of how this is looking render wise oh also the volume so you may notice it looks a bit cloudy in here that's another thing i've wanted to play with for ages volume disturbances should they be their own resource slash product or should they be part of afterglow this happens quite a lot when doing experimentation i think well there's so much variety that could be done with every particular thing i'm experimenting with should i make it its own thing or should it be a component of something else i think the pattern i tend to settle on is i do it as a component of a pre-existing product it becomes like a trial run and then i think yeah i can expand upon that in the future and then it will grow out into its own thing so in this case there's a volume cube which is the size of the environment here it's just a noise texture we're grabbing the object coordinate value for the cube of the volume. It's got a set scale with detail and I'm passing it through a color ramp to restrict it. So this provides us with black and white areas within the 3D domain. Then I'm multiplying it to give it like a density value so we can increase and decrease it. And then that is obviously passed as the density attribute to a principled volume, which is passed to the volume output of the material. So this gives us like a three dimensional disturbance. I'm going to unplug that triangles from the environment now. So the result is something really nice. And like I said as well, the plants are from the plant library from BD3D and I made some slight material adjustments to give it a bit more of a coat on the leaves because I thought that looked a bit more realistic in this type of lighting. And like I said, I will put a simpler version of this on the Patreon. If there are any assets I'm allowed to include, then I will. Like for example, this Wanderer character by Daniel Beistert. It's freely available on the Blender website as a demo file. Maybe he'll be okay with me putting it in the Patreon file since people can just download it anyway. I don't know, I'll see how it goes. But the plant library is something that you'll need to go and grab from Superhive. The font for the seven here, if you are interested, is Barlow. It's my favorite font. I use it for pretty much everything. It's like my brand font at this point. This particular one is the Barlow Condensed Extra Light. So for example, I can change that to, you know, anything else. Now it's a five. And I love the font style of this one. Now it's a one. So yeah. Let's take a look at other things. So if I disable the Wanderer, let me bring my human skull that I sculpted recently into the scene with my new physical presence material that I'm very happy with. Let's get a more appropriate angle. I can see the, uh, the emissive is going through it. But from here, for example, that looks quite cool. Again, I'm very happy with the material that I designed recently that's on the skull. I designed it specifically for sculpted objects where it can highlight curvature, but not in a way that's too overwhelming. Then it allows for some physical presence material changes that we've been experiencing or experimenting with recently for the exobiology project. You may have seen that video with the little alien embryo where we can define what areas are subsurf and which are transmissive based on geometry proximity. I'm not using that here, but that's an interesting technique. Let me disable the emissive pole to get rid of that extra light. Lighting. And this in itself is also, you know, an interesting demonstration. This should be a good use case for seeing how moving light around a cubic domain like this affects things because obviously a skull is quite a rounded thing. It's quite a good demo to see how the light bounces around. That would also be a good demo, say, for example, if I had a crisscross pattern or an image pattern, you would see that reflected very well on the skull. What else have I got? I do have the exobiology fetus here or embryo. So when I was doing this, I was thinking, oh, that looks really cool. What if like the vegetation was alien instead or like coral like if it was underwater, I'd be able to do some fantastic artwork with that. Now, this one is using that technique of using geometry proximity to define where the subsurf and transmission areas are. As we can see where the spheres were around the object, we got the pink subsurf there, the transmissive belly. And I love that. I've been coming up with like so many like cool techniques recently. I'm really happy with like how this has been going. Again, if you want early access to this file prior to me deconstructing it for Afterglow work, then get your ass on our Patreon. <laughs> 
$5 tier and you'll be able to break it down and have a look at how things work. What else have we got? Uh, Mercury from Warmer Castle. So this is a statue test of putting statues inside of the scene. They also look quite good. So if I had 3D scans or if I was sculpting something more humanoid, using something like this as a template scene would also look great. I mean, you know, with like the volume noise and the light coming down, physical presence material again. Well, fantastic. Okay, I'm very happy with how that's been going, if I haven't mentioned it enough already. All right, so let's let that render for a sec. So yeah, like I said, I'll do a stripped down version for the Patreon. I'll still make it as cool as I can. Again, I'm sure Daniel will be all right with me, including the character in the file. I already asked him if it was okay for me to use it for demonstration renders for Afterglow, and he said, well, that's what it's for. He's a really cool guy, you should check him out. So we've made it this far through the video. Let's think of an emoji to put in the comments. A number seven emoji, or a light emoji, or a cloud emoji, or a plant emoji. Put an emoji in the comments and if you do that it'll be our little secret it will show me if you made it this far through the video send out to my patreon curtisold.online slash patreon or check out my tools like afterglow curtisold.online slash store as you can tell it will be updated in the future with more content so yeah have a great day everyone stay safe and i'll see you next time